Welcome to our special show again uh, on uh, how government wants to limit number of temporary residents coming into the country. And I'm joined today with Mariam Jamal, business immigration lawyer at Sobirov's Law Firm. We will have some slides for you and there will be a lot of numbers, but stay tuned, prepare your questions about this topic. Mariam, let's dive into the topic sure. right away. Can you tell us what are what is the definition of temporary resident? So a temporary resident is anyone who uh, literally is in Canada on a temporary basis. Um, commonly, they're referred to as visitors, uh, students, workers. Um, these all are part of the temporary resident category. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have some numbers that were announced yeah. by... Uh, let's let, look at the numbers um, announced by the government. So the, the message was... Initially, the political message was that there were too many temporary residents in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, and there was an influx. Mar Mark Miller, the immigration minister, said temporary residents, as you mentioned, are international students, temporary foreign workers, and then uh, international mobility program mm -hmm. uh, workers, and asylum seekers. And the percentages are there, and we, based on the assumption that there are 2.5 million temporary residents in Canada at the moment. The numbers were calculated the following. Mm -hmm. I, I calculated myself. So percentage wise, 42% are international students, one of the biggest categories. Mm -hmm. And then 9% temporary foreign workers, which is around 225,000 people. And the largest uh, group, the biggest group is 44% temporary workers, which is uh, equals to 1.1 million people in mm -hmm. Canada working temporarily. And of course, asylum seekers, 5%, which represents one, 125,000. The government itself, and, and on, on our slide, we singled out that 44% of yeah. temporary workers. And let's go through that, that list sure. again. And 26% goes to, <coughs> excuse me, goes to postgraduate work permit holders who are previously international students. Yes. And 9% goes to the spouses of international students. Mm -hmm. And 10% uh, for reciprocal youth exchange programs like International Experience Canada. 12% mm -hmm. spouses of skilled workers. 26% are uh, arrivals through humanitarian programs such as Kuwait for mm -hmm. Ukrainians, Haitian program, Turkish and Syrian program, mm -hmm. and also the one, did I forget anything? Uh, there was the Iranian program, there was the uh, uh, program for. Um, uh, uh, Afghan citizens who were uh, again. I uh, see. It's a te temporary. Temporary, on a humanitarian yeah, temporary basis. humanitarian. They basis. are in Canada, and that forty-four yeah. percent is distributed accordingly. And seventeen percent goes for intra-company transfers, trade agreements, and and other yeah. uh, business immigration categories. So, setting this stage, uh, we we also saw Statistics Canada giving yeah. these numbers to us, which is. 1.2 million people are unemployed as mm -hmm. of February 2024. Around 400,000 people, they want to work. Uh, there's a typo there. Excuse, excuse us for that. They want to work, but we're not actively looking mm -hmm. for a job. Uh, and uh, roughly 637,000 vacancies are open, which is down from last year, where we had 1 million vacancies yeah. unfilled. And the unemployment rate has risen as a little bit from last month to 6.10%. Mm -hmm. And um, productivity, according to Bank of Canada, has fallen down mm -hmm. as compared to, let's say, late 1980s. Productivity yeah. was around 80, 88%, mm -hmm. I think, now as compared to the U.S., and now it's 71%, which means that businesses are not investing in technologies, yeah. equipment, and so on. And lastly, which is relevant to our topic, 5.25% is the Bank of Canada interest rate at the moment as we speak. Why I gave you these numbers? Let's analyze what's the, what's the background of limiting or decreasing mm -hmm. temporary residence. We're, maybe politics, maybe the social uh, people are not content they are not happy with the, what's going on in the country yeah. yeah well i mean first and foremost if you look at these numbers if you look at this breakdown um it's not as drastic as the news would have you think right mm -hmm. um or the announcement rather would have you think um you know a lot of the uh, individuals or, or categories that w are going to see a little bit of culling in the next little while are um kind of already associated with the students that, um, or the, the, the study permit stream that we've seen, um, 
go through changes initially in 2020 in early 2024 anyway so that's not going to have as huge of an impact as people think um i think the purpose of the announcement could be a political um uh, could have a political intent you know uh, we're going into an election year there's obviously change is always coming um, we're hyper focused on immigration ourselves but we see that change is coming in a lot of different departments as well in anticipation of what the next year uh, will look like and in t anticipation of um, you know voting and um, making sure you're hitting the right um, key points you're you're targeting the right people you're appealing to the right people um, to uh, get you where you want to be post-election, right? Mm -hmm. So um, when you break it down the way that we've broken it down, it's actually not as dramatic or drastic as um, we would initially believe because, you know, the categories speak for themselves. A lot of the categories that are going to be cut down or expected to be cut down or perhaps are taking up the greatest volume are already in the process of being cut down through other policy changes um, anyway. The example being the the Ukrainian program is yeah. is shut is being shut down, uh, which which has completed uh, its own purpose. I guess mm -hmm. three over three hundred thousand Ukrainians arrived in Canada, and uh, they are in 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 the economy. They they are looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. They need to settle down, and by stopping those programs, they will end. It's not like government is intentionally stopping them. They mm -hmm. will end this year, and now next year we're. We are actually talking about 2025, right? Yeah. 2024 will will end as 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 usual, mm -hmm. as, uh, business as is. And uh, the the background to give the background of this whole story was that um, housing crisis, right? Yeah. The too many temporary residents, too much demand on the housing markets, such as Toronto, Vancouver, mm -hmm. even Halifax, and and Canada was not building enough units, mm -hmm. residential units, for the last thirty years. Mm -hmm. It's not just a problem problem that we faced yesterday. It's been building up for for many decades. And uh, as as Justin Trudeau mentioned on April second, to give you an example, uh, in twenty seventeen, two percent of Canada's population was made of temporary immigrants. Now uh, at now it's at seven point five percent. And uh, Mark Miller mentions, and the IRCC mentions it at 6.2%. Mm -hmm. There's inconsistency between, yeah. between these numbers. And now the intention is to decrease it from whatever percentage, let's say it's 6.2% temporary mm -hmm. residents, to 5% in the next seven years. What you're saying, if I re uh, understood it correctly, this will happen eventually anyway. Yeah. Right? It's a natural consequence of a lot of the th things that we're already seeing changing, both um, things that have been already announced policy-wise and things that we we're seeing in terms of how we process or how immigration applications are processing. So just by virtue of the fact that um, there is now quotas for students, there's um, you know restrictions on specific institutions, there's restrictions on who gets a postgraduate work permits, that already is, a, is going to naturally mean that um, the volume or the the percentage of that that percentage for that category is going to shrink down. Temporary uh, residents will be, become less. And yes. Less going yes. Forward. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, with it, with business immigration or with other immigration applications, we're seeing you know it's behind the scenes because we get to see mm. behind the scenes the way that applications are being processed um, has been gradually changing over the last six months. So. Um, I don't anticipate that it's going to be drastically much different in the coming um, six months to a year, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just now it's becoming publicly announced, but um, in effect, it's already been taking place. So um, it's not going to be as drastic and, um, you know, uh, dramatic, yeah. again, yeah. as one would be led to believe. I see. Especially those categories, uh, entrepreneurship mm -hmm. categories, yeah. the business immigration. And, and the, the biggest hit, as you mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, was the international student yeah. body. Uh, over a million students were uh, in, in Canada. Going forward, the get government recently announced that there will be net zero increase mm -hmm. of student numbers in, in 2025, mm -hmm. 2026. And now they announced certain changes. Uh, for example, the LMIA change, right? Yeah. The LMIA was, will be, uh, the changes here uh, include that uh, both temporary, uh, basically, mar uh, starting this fall, mm -hmm. uh, for the first time, government will start counting the number of temporary residents. Yeah. Usually, as, as you correctly mentioned earlier, we were counting um, only permanent residents, yeah. right? 
and the immigration plan was about permanent residency. And mm -hmm. according to government plan in 2024, we expect to have 485,000 PR. Mm -hmm. But we don't know how many uh, temporary residents we will have. Yeah. And going forward in 2025 uh, and 26, it will be 500,000 annually. Yeah. So what's your take on this? These changes, the temporary residents will incre decrease uh, in 2025, 26, 27. How are we going to get those permanent residents? Um, well, I mean, you again, you just need to look at uh, Canada's immigration scheme, uh, or rather program in general, right? Mm -hmm. The um, It's always been, a, uh, as we say, a TR to PR pathway, right? Mm -hmm. Temporary resident to permanent resident pathway. So uh, when you look at that, when you look at it in that sense, this announcement earlier about the um, quotas or the, the goals for permanent residents, again, isn't as drastic because um, logically, if you're trying to hit a specific target for PR, mm -hmm. you have to have a specific target for temporary residence as well, right? Because mm -hmm. it flows into itself. I think what this means, though, is the priority over the next little while, um, perhaps for a year or two years, is going to be helping temporary residents in Canada, who are already in Canada, transition and being more selective about who becomes a temporary resident so that this pathway is more viable, right? Nice. It's more of an option. Um, so for those already in Canada, the transition, I don't expect to be interrupted. Mm -hmm. um, I expect it to be business as usual, possibly even more positive. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had a Canadian experience class draw in quite some time, so maybe we'll see a return to that. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely the facilitation internally within Canada of who, whoever's a temporary resident finding ways to, to help them transition because they've already, you know, they're already here, they're already working, they're already, um, you know, contributing to, to their communities. Um, and we want to keep that going. And we, they're being ready for, yes. uh, prepared for a PR transition, yes. right? And, and that's, I, I can, I, can, I, I agree with, the, with you, Mariam, is that for the last several years, we as lawyers noticed that it's really tough for someone to get PR on a first step, right? Mm -hmm. Someone has to come to Canada on a temporary status, yeah. be it international student or business owner. Then they get ready for PR. It's, it's mm -hmm. becoming tough, more, you know, more yeah. difficult to get it on, a, on your first try. So and the whole policy, the whole, I think, push was to make this uh, to bring candidates into Canada mm -hmm. temporarily and then make, prune them and you know, prepare them for for a permanent residence and yeah. we will see it more intensified going forward. I yeah. guess government made this, this statement, uh, sorry to interrupt, the government made this statement, uh, uh, Minister Miller in his, in his uh, statement in, in a video um, interview, quote, we will make more domestic draws for feds, federals, yeah. and ask provinces to do the same with their PNP. So that gives a clear message that those who are in Canada temporarily will probably have better chances, more programs created for them. Because remember, uh, uh, I, I brought this, what we did during COVID, yeah. right? We generously accepted temporary status mm -hmm. holders and welcomed them to PR yeah. in, in bulk, in, yeah. in, in, in droves. So yeah, so that's what, what, what we expect. And Let's focus now on LMIAs sure. and the workers. Like they, there's, there will be a decrease of low wage LMIA, mm -hmm. the percentage from 30, which was during the COVID mm -hmm. time, 30% to 20%, with certain exceptions in the construction and healthcare sectors. Yeah. Uh, at least until to, uh, this, this exception will apply at least until uh, end of August of this year. And LMIAs will stop being valid for 12 months. It yeah. will be back to six months. What's the rationale on, on these changes, so, behind these changes? I mean, I think it's quite connected all around. Again, we're getting back to this idea that it's all interconnected. One, we talked about the unemployment rate. So there's um, quite a number of people within Canada who are job seekers. And two, there's an influx of people in Canada, whether they're already workers, whether they're students, whether they're visitors who are switching their status, who um, are... Uh, part of this talent pool who have the potential to be hired. So I think the focus is to encourage uh, employers as much as they can to hire from within Canada, to focus their efforts within Canada before they look abroad, which has always been the case, but now this is an even more concerted effort to focus, focus yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, and uh, we, we brought these numbers from Bank of Canada where they said productivity of Canada 
there's a productivity yeah. crisis of Canada as compared to the U.S. has decreased significantly, mm -hmm. which basically is a message to, uh, to business owners to invest into equipment, technology, yeah. and so on to be less reliant on foreign worker yeah. uh, labor force, right? And uh, as you correctly mentioned, there are many thousands of people looking for jobs mm -hmm. in Canada, while especially in big metropolitan areas. And uh, the unemployment rate has increased from 5.8% to 6.10, yeah. 6 6.1% now. Um, so one conclusion, if we, uh, those who are watching us, our audience comprises of mo mostly uh, of business immigration mm -hmm. candidates. What would be your uh, tips any number of tips, one, two, three, four, five tips uh, on looking at this situation in Canada and reading the messages correctly. Yeah. Of course, the, 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 we are just speculating at the moment. Yeah. Government will have a meeting in May mm -hmm. with provinces and by fall, we will have a new immigration plan, so mm -hmm. to say, with temporary residents. What are your thoughts and tips for business immigration? Yeah, I think first and foremost, a good rule of thumb is to keep that significant benefit uh, that's attached to all, a lot of these programs in mind. Um, uh, a big, big tip, a good tip is scalability. So, um, you know, if you're coming to start a business or expand a business, making sure it's, it has the capacity to scale up, to hire people, to be um, active and um, fully operational is a big one. Um, we're seeing that consideration in a lot of applications anyway, uh, both in projections and in performance, right? When, when performance of a, a company has been evaluated, this is what they're looking for. Like, what have you been able to do, not just purely by making money, but by making creating opportunities, right? <clears throat> Another suggestion I would uh, give is take a look at these provinces that are perhaps aren't um, as um, as popular, as popular yeah. or as uh, that or, or that come to mind uh, the ones that don't come to mind immediately right mm -hmm. so we've got Ontario we've got BC both great provinces um, they are <laughs> the cost of living is quite high the cost of business is quite high so there's a lot of uh, pros and cons but there's a lot of opportunity also in the prairie provinces Alberta uh, Manitoba Saskatchewan in the Atlantic provinces uh, you know Newfoundland Nova Scotia um, New Brunswick, New Brunswick yeah. PEI, Prince Edward Island. So there's a lot of opportunities outside of these major, major hubs. And, you know, there's opportunities in Quebec as well um, that, you know, you want people might want to look at, right? Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Don't disregard them is essentially uh, the message here, especially with the, um, with uh, Minister Miller's um kind of a hint towards PNP, right? Mm -hmm. The provincial nominee programs. Yeah. There, This is something we've been seeing recurring in messaging um, for immigration is the provinces, um, you know, going back to the provinces, giving them a greater hand. So I know provinces have um, really focused in on the foreign worker aspect. I'd like them to see, uh, to see them focus more on the entrepreneur and business owner aspect um, to encourage that kind of investment in the provinces, but don't, don't disregard them. Excellent, excellent points. And I have some feedback and tips. Uh, number one is now Canada has given quotas for international students for each province. Some provinces are losing, some provinces are gaining. So your point to look beyond major popular provinces like BC and Ontario, mm -hmm. you will have more international students in Nova Scotia, for example, in New Brunswick, less international students in Ontario and BC going forward which means that you have potential better or larger candidate pool for your for your business to employ them to to you know convert them into your permanent and loyal workers and help them to become uh, permanent residents second thing is now pnps the pro provinces are becoming more active yes. in a way aggressively active like P alberta and quebec are demanding more control mm -hmm. over immigration we we've seen that over the last couple of days a uh, couple of weeks and they, there are certain location-based programs like rural and northern yeah. immigration becoming permanent program. If you want to go to Sudbury, to, to Timmins, mm -hmm. to uh, Thunder Bay, these are good provinces with good, good locations within the province of Ontario. Yeah. There, there, are, there are business <laughs> opportunities there. And the lastly, I think with these all changes that we discussed today, business immigration will not be impacted. If it will be impacted, then it will be minimal. Why? Because we have two big problems that we will discuss in the, in the coming shows. One is aging 
population, yes. which means that aging business owners who want to retire, they want to sell their businesses so that the business continues mm -hmm. and government is interested in the continuity of the of continuing those businesses because they pay taxes, they employ yeah. people. Second is uh, when business immigration is about creating jobs for Canada, yeah. for Canadians, the significant benefit aspect that you mentioned. So government, when, when the employment is, uh, unemployment is rising, there are, there, there's an aging, pro aging population problem and also they want to bring more businesses to Canada. Maybe it's a startup, mm -hmm. maybe it's an, a brick and mortar business. Yeah. But the message I read, I, I felt from Bank of Canada's uh, productivity uh, problem is they want businesses to invest into more into technology, becoming more productive in a way. Uh, relying on labor force is not, doesn't make your business productive. So in your business plan, when, we, when you review the business plan of our clients, I think we will have to pay more attention on technology, on how to, impl how to become productive company rather than just relying on labor force, human, human force. And uh, these are my conclusions and not a significant de decline in business immigration. Maybe we'll go pro uh, program by program. ICT, intra-company transfer, what do you think? <laughs> Let's go program by program. Um, ICT, we have seen some changes in how uh, the government is treating the intercompany transfer program over the last six months. Yeah. I've worked extensively with ICTs. Um, there's a, a shift away from there. You know, during COVID, there was a, a huge embrace for startup companies, um, as in companies who are just getting their start in Canada mm -hmm. specifically. Um, while that hasn't completely disappeared, there's definitely now more. Um, perhaps reservation uh, up front before an acceptance, com acceptance comes through. So mm -hmm. what I mean by reservation is they want to see a little bit more um, evidence of what you're able to achieve. So that's, uh, it can be shown in a couple of ways. If you already have multiple locations around the world, then that speaks for itself, your ability to scale up um, and, and replicate expand. and expand yeah. from you know country to country or region to region. If not, then what, uh, you know, IRCC officers really, really appreciate is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when you show you put your best foot forward and you show that you've already tried to make some strides in Canada before applying. So what can you do for your business in Canada before, you know, applying to come physically run it? What is reasonable for you to achieve remotely in the meantime? Um, and uh, t to give IRCC an idea of what you hope to do, what you plan to do, how your commitment level to this. Mm -hmm. um, these are all factors that really positively, Im positively impact applications. Mm -hmm. So um, this is what I mean. Like the changes to these programs aren't things that we expect in the future. There are already changes we're already seeing. And it's not like the programs are drastically moving away from their norm. They're just becoming more refined in what they look for. And formalized by and the formalized, government. They, exactly. they put it on a paper, right? Yeah. In, in, a, in a sense. Okay. Now, startup visa program. Yes, startup visa program. It's on everyone's mind. It's the yeah. most popular one to discuss. Yeah. Um, we are, I would say we're still in a little bit of a, um, a shift period. There's a lot of uh, talk about how the startup visa program is going to develop or change. Um, obviously, we're seeing, we saw the change in 2023 related to the work permit provisions with, with significant benefit. Again, see, significant benefit continues to come back in all these Being programs. The center stage all yes. the time. Yeah. And it's more than just purely economic. It's more than purely revenue-based. It's what are you bringing to the table socially, culturally? Um, what are you bringing beyond just like revenue mm -hmm. for Canada as a whole? How are you contributing more meaningfully to Canada, right? Um, so startup visa program for me is still a little bit up in the air. It's still running strong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still going well, still seeing a lot of great candidates come to Canada. Yep. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some more refinement on that front as well in, a, in, in the you know next couple of months or next year and a half. I see. So between startup and ICT, I think ICT approval rates, even in our practice, has decreased over the yeah. over the years because, as you said, the emphasis is now not on the new newly established mm -hmm. or first expansions to Canada. Yeah. You gotta have you have to have more experience in expanding to other parts of the world and then become literally multinational and then yeah. uh, do the ICT. Whereas startup visa program by nature is a startup. It's your first yeah. attempt to do business in Canada. Yeah, and what I read into that, what I interpret that to mean is, you know, 
the government is not saying we don't want startup, we don't want innovation, we don't want something new, mm -hmm. but they are saying there are certain streams for that and they're now trying to differentiate a lot more, right? Mm -hmm. So the ICT program, the intercompany transfer program, they're focusing in and reinforcing like the purpose of this program isn't for a startup, a pure startup mm -hmm. or a brand new initiative or something that hasn't, you know, um, that proven itself on a global record, level, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's for these established businesses, mm -hmm. but there is the startup visa program, there's the C11 entrepreneur work permit program. Which we will discuss, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are other avenues as well that are available or for even PNP entrepreneurs, or PNP entrepreneur if you streams. Are exactly. Focus on certain problems. Yeah. So let's go to C11 significant benefit. Yeah. You you touched up on on the significant benefit side, but your your thoughts? What's going to happen to that program? Yeah. So I think the program's going strong. We've definitely seen. Again, I like to call it refinement because the program hasn't um, drastically changed um, um, from its origin so much as it's written in. A lot of the stuff that we kind of knew implicitly based on our experience is now written in, into the guidelines. We've seen a lot of uh, success with business purchases, which goes to what you're saying about the aging population. A lot of businesses are going for sale for a number of reasons. And um, obviously, any time a business you know, closes or, or isn't sustained by its owners, it's, it give, it's a hit to the local economy. So um, we're seeing a lot of uh, success with business purchases. Um, we're seeing a lot of success in a wide range of industries that depend on location. So tech is always a big one. Tech and innovation is always at the you know, forefront and top priority of the government. But so, um, so is more, more uh, directed local focus needs, right? Mm -hmm. So tech across the board on a national level is important. But what has also proven to be successful is when uh, applicants, when clients look at the community they're moving into and look at the needs of that community and address those needs, um, that's a big deal too, right? So if they go to a rural area, right, that doesn't really have a cafe or a restaurant or there has, it's something a lot more rudimentary maybe, mm -hmm. even a grocery store sometimes, um, can be successful in more rural areas because it's what the location needs, right? So it's very nuanced. It's, uh, it's not a one, one size fits all yes. program, which is really great, right? right? Because mm -hmm. it means that there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of different people in a lot of different industries across the country. Mm -hmm. Good points there on C11. Now you 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 mentioned location. So now yeah. let's talk about PNP, Provincial Nominee Program Entrepreneur Streams. What do you see? And then you can maybe uh, combine it with rural and northern immigration program. Again, yeah. it depends on localities across Canada. Yeah. So um, you know, I think there's a lot of potential with the provincial nominee programs. Um, both for applicants and for the provinces to, to improve them a little bit, to be honest with you. Um, there's a lot of requirements around these programs that sometimes um, burdensome. cause... They're, 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 they are burdensome, yeah. right? They are burdensome, burdensome. they're high-risk uh, association, and um, it, it doesn't endear people to them, right? Yes. People typically shy away and look for other options because the threshold that they have to reach to be able to even benefit from the program is quite high. So I would like to see a little bit more flexibility from the provinces. Um, I know Ontario has suspended their entrepreneur silently. program <laughs> indefinitely, <laughs> silently. silently yeah. um, so hopefully that means they're, they're modifying, they're coming up with something new and something more accessible. Um, the rural stream right now, the rural um, pilot that's become more of a permanent program is still focused on temporary workers rather than entrepreneurs. I would love to see a stream come up for entrepreneurs specifically um, because a lot of these locations, again, especially when we talk about, you know, if we're going to look bigger picture with students being, um, um, you know, uh, or, or the, the need for students being focused on certain provinces and not others, um, these are all not only future employees that are going to need places to work, mm -hmm. but they're also, you know, an indication of the investment that's going to go into the community, right? I see. The more people that yeah. are going to be there, the more, you know, more consumers, consumers, the more consumers labor exactly, force exactly. So the more yeah, development yeah. is going to yeah. happen around yeah. these communities. So it would be great to see the provinces, especially in, or yeah, the provincial nominee program, especially in provinces that are considered more generally rural, mm -hmm. um, take advantage and um, put something together um, under, under the rural. Uh, 
umbrella. I see. And I want them to remove the net worth requirement oh, because the net worth, the requirement. net worth requirements, if you compare to federal business yeah. immigration programs where, where they don't have net worth requirement and you can go to Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba yeah. to, to do the same thing, which you can do through PNPs w to interact closer, cl in a more close manner with, with the province and, and, and visit the province. And why this net worth requirement is there, I don't know. But I think yeah. it's time to remove that. The net worth that requirement, net. the rigid like, commitment agreement that has to be put together. I do understand from a provincial perspective the need to like have some security and safety for the province. I mm -hmm. do understand that. But you know, to win big, you have to risk big, exactly. right? You have to take and risks and attract answerable. more, right? Yeah. So you want these people to come to the province, you know, you're risk averse, you don't want to risk people coming and not fulfilling and not providing a need, yeah. but then what's the incentive for the business owner and the entrepreneur to take that risk then in, yes. in return? And it's as if you, you're, <clears throat> as a province, you're demanding the entrepreneur to be successful. Like it's a, it's a, it's a, like a guarantee letter that you will be successful yeah. and then I will nominate you to, yeah. to it's, it's a bit uh, burdensome, but we will talk about it sure. in, the, in, yeah. the, in the near future. Hopefully entrepreneurs uh, going to provinces, they will consider them seriously. If you want to visit the provinces, let us know. We, 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 uh, we can help you with business immigration mm -hmm. trips, like exploratory, exploratory trips, trips yeah. and, and so on. So we touched upon many programs. It's mm -hmm. a very high level and it's a speculative. Until fall of this year, we will have a lot of yeah. changes. <clears throat> we'll keep you updated. Now it's time for your questions, but let's take a quick break until uh, for a few seconds and let's get to your questions. To stay updated on all things related to Canadian business immigration, check us out on social media. Follow us on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter for the latest news and updates. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell to stay informed about the most recent immigration news, interviews with top immigration specialists, and our weekly live shows. Visit our website at www.sabirovs.com for more information or to book a consultation with our team of experts. And it's time for your questions now. Thank you for joining us from different parts of the world. Let's take the question number one. Okay, Shana Rafi, hello Shana, is asking the following question. Mariam, hello. Is there any chance for a medical doctor who has a radiology clinic with 14 employees in overseas apply for ICT, intercompany transfer, as there's no company and the business is a private clinic? I'm going to answer the way lawyers love to answer. Yes, it, it, de depends. it depends. <laughs> but, uh -huh. um, there is potential. Um, some things to keep in mind. Uh, one, not having a, a corporate structure is not necessarily the end of the line for ICT. Mm -hmm. It's very evidence-based. So we've had, um, you know, it's about what evidence you can put together. And if ICT doesn't work, there's, there's alternatives um, that might. Um, for anything related to the medical field, though, with radiology, you want to keep in mind the um, restrictions, the licensing requirements regulations. and regu regulations mm -hmm. in Canada. That might be a barrier more than the immigration program. Um, so if the goal is to start a business in Canada, it may be better to switch off of the pure medical route or mm -hmm. regulated licensed route and find something maybe adjacent, mm -hmm. something more accessible. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is um, yes, I see that she has a follow-up question, yeah, a follow -up, uh, yes. which is if yes, the business should be exactly the same. Yes, so it, maybe not exactly, but substantially similar. The function of the intercompany transfer program is to um, allow businesses to expand and extend their existing activity into Canada. So that requires that the activity be at least in some capacity related to what they're sector, currently doing. Uh, yeah. yeah, very close. Yeah. Because you need to prove that the business is viable, and yeah. then that you can run this business uh, potentially successfully, yeah. right? And yeah. to add to Shana's question, maybe we can look at that question and develop it further. Mm -hmm. Is it necessarily the ICT route or more like C11 route? Because it could be C11. Yeah. yeah, so this is what I meant by there could be other programs that work. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when business owners have their have businesses and they're looking to come to Canada, their mind first goes to the ICT program because it seems to fit their situation best. Mm -hmm. But 
if their intention is to diversify or in their, they're in a field that's not as accessible to them in Canada, the ICT program can be quite restrictive, mm -hmm. right? So in that case, what we do is we see if C11 fits better and what options are available under C11, right? It also opens up the opportunity a lot more for you know business purchase, mm -hmm. for franchise purchase, mm -hmm. for different options um, and more flexibility than you would have under the ICT program. Mm -hmm. And also to add to the industry uh, of medical services, yeah. there's a huge need. Uh, a we, huge we, have, we have lack of doctors there. Yeah. We don't have enough doctors here. But as a foreign trained doctor, you cannot practice medicine in Canada yeah. unless you become licensed by the, exactly. by the College of Surgeons and uh, the Medical College. And, yeah. uh, and in that scenario, you can be an owner of a clinic, but you will hire those who are licensed in Canada yeah. to, on an hourly basis on a, or part-time basis so that they can serve your clients, right? So yeah. this is so, another structure to think about. Exactly. You end up being the shareholder and then the entrepreneur. Exactly. My advice for any of any time anyone wants to go into a regulated industry, even something like engineering, which varies province by province, is you got to take a look. You got to mm -hmm. take a look at what the actual requirements are. I know for lawyers, for example, in the legal field, to be to own a law firm, you have to be licensed. It's not in, you know, it's not like a lot of other yes, countries yes. will allow for yeah. for other professionals to own but employ. So keep a look, keep an eye out, do your research before starting. It's rarely ever a scenario where there's no need for these professionals. Mm -hmm. It's the requirements for these professionals to actually practice in Canada are uh, is the kind of the barrier that needs to be yeah. uh, overcome. And to add last yeah. point to uh, Shana's uh, question, thank you, by the way, for this interesting question. You may also think about Startup Visa program mm -hmm. if you have something innovative in your, yes. in your business and your, your ultimate goal is to become PR. Yeah. So look at the uh, Startup Visa program when, of course, medical equipment and things are a bit difficult to patent and get mm -hmm. uh, uh, IP on that. But a medical-related startups are what they call med tech yeah. are very popular med and uh, med tech users, yeah uh, Tel uh, telehealth you know yeah. long remote health yeah. uh, cons consulting so think about those and uh, exactly. if you want to get a uh, you know down to strategizing your your pathway contact us at mm -hmm. sobirovs.com so next question i i received in advance so now we are going into election year yes. next year 2025 is an election year. In October, we will see who wins. <laughs> yes. And uh, um, now, in pre we don't have much time left, to be honest. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, one year will pass very quickly. What do you expect, other than these changes, that the current government will try to do in terms of immigration? Oh, that's a great that's question. A, um, I think the closer we get to an election year, every party is going to start... Um, taking a look at their voter base, take a look at their uh, odds and see how they have to... Please them. Yeah, I was going to say more so, <laughs> adjust their messaging accordingly. Yeah, let's be honest, but we, yeah. we straightforward talk. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, we have a history, if we want to get into, you know, the very specifics of Canadian politics, we typically have a two-term pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had, uh, I think, two and a half now because we, we had an early election. Yeah. Um, for the Liberals, it's not inconceivable that the next election will go to the Conservatives. So I can or someone or some or the NDP or the, or, NDP, or the Green yeah, Party yeah, or yeah. Blocker. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of options, but it is a two two uh, term pattern. That's what we've been seeing. Um, so what I would imagine is the Liberal Party that's currently in power, that's currently you know um, running the show, so to yeah, speak, yeah. is going to be taking a look at how to solidify its existing voter base and how to attract voter base from both ends, right? The Liberals typically are in the center, mm -hmm. so they'll be looking to see how can they draw in the more, um, you know, uh, fringe voters from the right and the left, mm -hmm. the right and the left, rather. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see policies develop around that, right? So uh, from the left, we'll typically see uh, a greater push for humanitarian programs, but we may also see this in different factors. So maybe it's not going to be focused on immigration if it's mm -hmm. anything to go by. Um, this appeal to the left may be through different programs. You know, we've got pharmacare up on the table. We've got, um, again, the focus on housing and, and, um, and the like. That may be what draws in from the left, from the more um, social 
um, security mm -hmm. socialist yeah, <laughs> camp yeah. from the right where you have more conservative, more pe people who are more um, economically driven, economically focused. That's where I see um, immigration heading a little bit there, mm -hmm. which, is, which is good for business immigrants, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. The focus on economic uh, benefit, the focus on switching the narrative to oh, immigrants are creating this, you know, issue, mm -hmm. these issues that we're having, whether it's housing or otherwise, mm -hmm. to immigrants are actually bringing opportunity. And they're doing that because we're very specific about who we're looking for. And we're looking for people who are going to contribute positively, who are going to improve the economic state of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another question. <clears throat> last, last immigration minister, pre former mm -hmm. immigration minister, Sean Fraser, he announced that there will be an innovation stream by mm -hmm. end of 2024, uh, 2023, which never mm -hmm. happened, unfortunately. And we are not seeing any any indications that it will happen with this current minister. Yeah. Do you think it will? It's it's coming anytime soon. It will be. They were they were saying that it will be LMI exempt category, mm -hmm. similar to ICTs or C11s. Yeah. Uh, and it will be called innovation stream, and that's it. They they closed the chapter. They never came. Yeah back to you it. You know, it's hard to say, honestly. I'm, I'm thinking of it and while I, I would like to say yes, it's coming, I would like to think that if the ministry announces something, it um, it if pans you, out. Um, and it's pathway. Yes, and it's a great pathway. It sound, Or rather, it sounds like it'll be a great mm -hmm. pathway when it does come out. Um, but you have to wonder, how are they going to balance this out with these you know, announcements that they're saying about limiting temporary residents mm -hmm. and limiting PR and or rather limiting, um, you know, students and, and meeting these quotas. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd be very interested to see how they, I hope they manage to, to actually uh, follow through with it. And I'd be interested to see how they do that within the scope of what they're announcing and, and the parameters they're setting for the next two years. Uh, last question, which, <clears throat> which relates to World Cup, which is coming mm -hmm. in 2026. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing now in the next three years, we will decrease the number of temporary residents in, to Canada, in Canada, and tourists are temporary residents. Yeah. Well, and the World Cup is coming to Canada, to mm -hmm. Vancouver and Toronto. How do you reconcile these two messages? Yeah, so right now Canada has a, a provision or has had a provision where if you're in Canada on a visitor visa, you can apply for a work permit. I would imagine in anticipation of the World Cup to kind of stem the flow of, of individuals to keep with this, again, this um, messaging, this, this uh, plan to limit temporary residents, that will probably be... At, revoked or changed we'll pause, or modified pause, pause for, for the for World, the World Cup, Cup yeah. so that we can welcome visitors, yeah. but we don't have to compromise um, or the government doesn't have to compromise on this um, mandate that they've set to limit temporary residents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Let's check if we have more questions. If not, then we'll say goodbye. I think uh, it was a great talk today. And if you need to build your immigration strategy, you need a competent, honest and caring team on your side. Yes, Team Canada is here and we will be happy to help you with your immigration strategy. You can book a consultation with our lawyers, specifically with Mariam. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, leave them under this video as a comment and we will get to those questions in due course. Thank you, Mariam, for taking the time today. And today is a solar eclipse, so yeah. <laughs> I hope you will enjoy that and I hope the weather will cooperate with us. Uh, it's, it's still cloudy, but uh, I'll leave you with that. Enjoy the eclipse and see you next time. Thank Sounds you. Sounds good. Thank you for having me, Rahman. Thank you. Are you constantly on the move, managing your business, and looking for a convenient way to stay informed about expanding your business to Canada? Look no further. Introducing Speaking of Canada, the podcast that keeps you in the loop on all things related to Canadian business immigration, delivering the latest news and valuable tips and captivating interviews, no matter how busy your schedule gets. Speaking of Canada has got you covered.